Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, session. It's the first panel of the day and uh, my name is Romana Ramzan. I'm a game design lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University. I um, am also on the committee for um, BAFTA Scotland for Games, which is why I'm hosting this panel. And uh, I think I've seen quite a few of you at various game jams in and around, um, I would say Scotland, but mostly Glasgow. Um, anyways, I've been doing this thing for quite a while, uh, so I don't think I need to talk much more about myself, but what I will do is introduce you to my wonderful panelists here today. Um, I have uh, Stephen Tarlin from Tag Games, and I then have Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Doyle-Morris <laughs> from Inclusique. Inclusique yeah. <laughs> and um, also I have Zoe Sams here from IGDA Scotland. So what I would like to do is now hand over to each of them to tell you a little bit more about themselves because they'll do it more justice than I ever will. Stephen? Sure, yeah. So um, as you mentioned, um, I work at Tag Games. Um, I kind of uh, alongside that, I run a game jam called Rainbow Game Jam, and I'm um, a member of the IGDA Scotland board. Um, so part of that is kind of like me trying to advocate for kind of like LGBT people in games and uh, LGBT people in game development. Uh, so that's kind of like my, my shtick at the minute. <laughs> it's kind of working on that kind of stuff. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Rainbow Game Jam and sort of I, I guess what your main motivating factor behind it was for starting that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so at GDC 2016, um, I kind of went along to this LGBT event and had a great time. It was really like great and stuff like that. Um, and the kind of I came away from it feeling that it was really nice being there, but it felt very kind of like American focused, and it felt like a lot of people were kind of talking about like um, issues in the games industry in America and uh, diversity in like that industry. And I was like, well. Scotland's a huge game scene. We've got these huge studios and we've got all these different kind of clusters of game scenes, uh, indie and stuff like that. I was like, why don't we have this kind of LGBT movement in games in Scotland? So I kind of started um, a small group called the Scottish Rainbow Game Dev Group. Um, and that was about kind of like finding and trying to find a way to promote LGBT people in games in the Scottish games industry and try and uh, share and have a safe space for people to kind of communicate and uh, something from there. Um, from that kind of like span off Rainbow Game Jam, which started as a, okay, we'll do this LGBT themed game jam in Scotland. And from there, it just kind of got a bit bigger as I kind of like gained sponsors. It's like, oh, now it's kind of international. And there's people from like Brazil taking part. And I was like, oh, this is a lot bigger than I kind of expected it to be. Um, so the motivation kind of there was to kind of give people the opportunity to um, explore LGBT themes in games um, and I think that's something really powerful about game jams is that it creates a reason for people to to make a game especially about cause um, so last year kind of like we had this game jam and it, it kind of it runs over two weeks to kind of allow access to people it's one of those things where like 48 hour game jams aren't the most accessible especially for people who work kind of like nine to five and stuff like that so trying to be as accessible and open to as many people as possible so we kind of get more uh, opportunity to see games about LGBT themes and uh, exploring different ideas and kind of like running that again this year and seeing kind of like how it's grown and how the community are kind of reacting to that and it's been really exciting. Fantastic. So how many have you, how many game jams have you done to date then? So this is the second Rainbow Game Jam finished just last weekend. Okay. Uh, so how yeah. many people did you have in the first one? So the first one, there was about 150 people signed up and there was 31 games entered by the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, this year, it was over 250 people signed up and 42, 43 games Fantastic. submitted. Well done. Yeah. That's amazing. Brilliant. Um, I'd now like to ask you, Zoe, to tell us a bit about yourself and sort of how you got into the games industry as well. Sure. Um, yep, well, I'm Zoe. Uh, by day, I'm a tools programmer. What I really enjoy doing is helping other people as well as solving problems. So tools programming, I find, is a really nice mix of the two of these. Um, and in my spare time, I volunteer in many different capacities, one of these being on the board of directors for IGDA Scotland. Um, I really enjoy the work that I can do for the Scottish games industry, try and put on events, and hopefully grow that to be putting on events that help actually the games industry that we have now and help expand it and, and make it a better place. Um, but I'm also a STEM ambassador at the same time, uh, which involves helping 
school children and children from the ages really of kind of like eight to 18 um, with specifically science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but more for me, for video games. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I'll come back and ask you some questions about your role as a STEM ambassador as well. And um, Suzanne, what about yourself? Can you just tell us a bit? Yeah, so I have come out of a background where I've done 20 years of consulting, not in the games area, but looking at how companies can be more inclusive in their workplace practices. Um, and a few years ago, I became really interested in the way games can actually create social change. And I thought, is there a way we could create games that actually get people thinking about the implications of their even seemingly innocent choices uh, in things like recruitment and how we promote and who we hire and what is the culture we want to create here. And I started building games. Um, now, my tech team will tell you I knew nothing about the industry um, to the point that I you know, would have thought you know, Jason and Ruby were like some kind of techpreneur couple. Um, <laughs> uh, and I thought maybe they'd broken up, but now they're back together, which is why Ruby was on the rails. You know, <laughs> thank God I met the right people. But I met it, made it my, you know, my purpose to meet the right people because I thought, let's look at how we can use games to get people to see the outcomes of their actions. Um, and now we use that in training for companies. And, you know, that's been widely accepted by a lot of organizations that are really like, how do we put something fun, which games have, you know, the reputation of being, on really nuanced and tough topics. Uh, and the topics we look at are, how do you become better managers in an increasingly diverse workplace? Um, and that's where we focus. Slightly distracted. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, again, I will come back to you, Suzanne, yeah. on some more questions about <laughs> um, the games that you've built mm. and sort of your experiences mm -hmm. there. Um, what I would like to ask you, uh, each one of you, I suppose, is have you experienced any first hand discrimination um, in your respective workplaces, uh, be it you know, when you've been volunteering for things or even just in your day to day job? And how have you dealt with that? Open to the floor. Whoever wants to jump in. Um, I actually personally haven't really dis experienced discrimination within the industry itself, um, especially I think in Scotland. I think we're very lucky that we have we live in quite a diverse country and a country that's pushing for change. But I did experience a lot when I was younger, um, specifically when I was coming in to study games and to pursue that as a career. When I was a teenager, I surrounded myself with really quite awful people, um, people who were. <laughs> kind of, they would bring out the, or they would enable the uh, female chauvinist pig in me, which is kind of a, a term to describe um, women who sit there like, I'm not like normal girls. I do this and I'm not like anything like that. And I, I was, as a teenager, I was quite awful at that. Um, but these people that surrounded me also weren't very supportive of what I actually did and didn't believe in me at all. So when I went to study um, at Aberté, while the environment I was in was inclusive, the people from outside of that who weren't in the industry were very judgmental of that. I had one um, person tell me that I was a slut and that I was only interested in video games for the attention of men. Um, and that kind of, it took me back quite a bit because I had started the course as the only woman on my course. Um, and I'm pretty sure we had an entry of about 66 people. So I suddenly started to worry, was he right? Was, is that what everyone thinks of me? Is that, is that always going to be the theme throughout? But um, I'm lucky that I stopped surrounding myself with awful people um, and started surrounding myself <laughs> with people yeah. who were nice and inclusive and showed that that's not the case at all. Like That's not a stereotype to perpetuate and everyone who I've met in the industry has has been very supportive of that vision. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you kind of touched upon a, a bit of you know discrimination, I suppose, out with. But I think that applies to both of you as well. Have you experienced that, even if not in the workplace, have you experienced it out with the workplace? So I think that building on Zoe's uh, mantra, which is a good one for all of us, which is surround yourself with cool people. Um, I'm really fortunate in that when I came to the industry, I remember thinking, I know very little about this. I don't have a technical background myself, but I was, I really made it my, my goal to meet people who were inclusive and also thought what I was doing was cool. And I, I hand on heart, I've got to say, I'm 
surprised at how many cool, white, straight men I didn't expect great things from necessarily, but were really down with this. Um, and that was amazing uh, because I had not had a huge reaction positive initially. Um, and actually some of them are in this room and they've been huge supporters to me and to what we're doing because actually creating a inclusive workplace and world for all of us it helps everyone get on better because we could talk about the way women are portrayed in often mainstream games, but actually the way men are portrayed is, you know, it's so limiting, the stereotypes we have about gender roles. Um, so that's been really positive to me. But yeah, I have experienced other things I've been told early on that I would be far more successful in getting funding if I had a male founder. Um, Sorry, it's just me, you know? Uh, ooh, I only have a PhD from Cambridge, but I guess that's not good enough, you know, on the topics. And what was interesting is, uh, you know, taking that down to a really micro level, um, last year we were running one of our games for ARM, a big tech company uh, with their millennials, and I had a lot of great feedback. In fact, ARM came back and said that it was the most successful of all the training they'd done that whole week. No games had been used other than in ours. And I did have a, a one guy come up to me and he asked me, said, that was really fun. I, you know, it was really cool to see how it worked. Uh, he said, do you have any guys on your team? And I didn't understand what he meant. I said, yeah, we do. We've got, you know, some of our developers are guys and the guy help, helping with marketing is a guy. What he, what he goes, oh no, I mean, I think I would have heard everything that you said better if it had come from a man. Wow. So I, and, and he said, so I'm not sure why we need this. I'm like, that is why we need this. <laughs> <laughs> that in itself. We need to hear more voices because actually the people who play games are so rare, so, so varied. So we need those people building games. Uh, we need better representations of the, you know, the variance that is this world. Um, so yeah, I've experienced it, but I've also been humbled by the very cool people I've been fortunate enough to work with who get this. I know that this is the way the world is working now. <laughs> How about yourself, Stephen? I think kind of like a lot of similar kind of experiences. Um, nothing directly in the workplace, and if anything, I, I agree with like Zoe's statement of like the Scottish games industry is very mm -hmm. supportive and inclusive. Um, kind of non-direct thing of like, um, while I was at GDC this year, I was um, attending an event and had a few too many drinks and was somehow in front of a camera for Xbox uh, talking about the importance of uh, LGBT uh, representation in games and why uh, LGBT events around games are really important. And kind of forgot about this thing and this video then appeared a few months later and then just slowly scrolling through the comments section and yeah, like, obviously don't read the comments, but like, oh, I'm in this, I should actually have a look at this. And, Although nothing was specifically directed at me, just seeing, uh, I think it was something like referring to LGBT people as cancer in the games industry, and I was like, that is actually, like, seeing myself on the other side of that was really bizarre. And just seeing that outlash of people just kind of like rejecting this idea of diversity and diverse people. And I'm sitting there looking at it being like, you're, you're hating on the people who, I'm looking at the other people in this video, I'm like, all of these people have worked on amazing projects. Mm -hmm. The people at this event, like, people from like Naughty Dog were there and stuff like that, and like, they're literally making the games that you fall in love with and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And to see this kind of like outlash at, because diversity in games is so toxic, um, it was really kind of difficult to see. Um, and it was kind of one of those reasons why I wanted to kind of, it, one of those reasons I wanted to start Rainbow Game Jam and the kind of the Scottish Rainbow Game Dev scene was kind of, try and find ways to like, empower people and promote people, um, LGBT people for others and students and stuff like that. Um, I was never out like, during university and stuff like that. And going to the games industry, I didn't know what to kind of expect, like LGBT representation in companies or how much people were kind of promoted. And I found, I still kind of find it's not that much depending on kind of company to company. Like company, the company I work for is really supportive of me and the stuff I do. Uh, but as far as I know, there's not any other kind of LGBT people in that office. And I kind of find the same in a lot of other offices. So I hope that in some way I can kind of inspire people to kind of like be out and represent themselves. Like I'm not like the greatest example of a developer or anything like that, but I hope that I can inspire other people to go on and do bigger things and promote their own voice in some way. And have you had any sort of feedback from the participants? If, you know, by participating in Rainbow Jam, has that what kind of an impact that has had on their life, if, if any, or? It's been, 
I think the biggest thing I've kind of seen is people being really excited that there's a game jam focused on these kind of like queer themes. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely other game jams out there that do this. And like I hope that people take part in those and kind of like be involved. But I think it's like it's bringing a small community together over like a short period of time and sharing ideas and getting feedback on their ideas and exploring these themes that they might not have otherwise done mm -hmm. in that kind of like space of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just making making opportunities for people. And I think that's what kind of is kind of being done with Rainbow Game Jam, is kind of just making a chance for people to kind of do this, this kind of stuff that they might not otherwise have felt that they could during another mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, Zoe, I'm going to come back to you and just ask you to tell us a bit about um, your role as a STEM ambassador and sort of what do you think are the biggest hurdles um, that are facing you know, young women or young girls to get into the games industry and sort of how do you tackle that? Okay. Um, well, I might kind of come back to my role as a STEM ambassador by explaining this first. I think that one of the biggest hurdles for actually any diversity at all, not just women, to get into games is education itself. Um, education has come a long way, especially recently, but when I was at school, I said I was quite, uh, I was a straight A student. I liked maths, I liked science, um, or I was good at maths and science, but I liked art and I liked creative subjects. And it took me a really long time to work out what I wanted to do until I found games. And I was like, this is perfect. It is the perfect blend of the two. I love playing games, like this is a dream come true. And I told my teachers this and they were like, mm, no. Um, they, were, they weren't supportive. Um, they very much felt that because I was a smart student, I should be um, applying to modular subjects. They pushed me to go to um, Oxford or Cambridge rather than Aberty. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and they generally didn't see the benefits of it until um, it was actually my English teacher who took me aside one day and went, you're absolutely doing the right thing. We have guidance counselors, etc., and careers people who may not think you're doing the right thing because they've been trained a certain way, but you're absolutely, like, these are the kind of industries that are pushing forward. So it was my English teacher, um, Mr. Brown, uh, <laughs> that, um, that pushed me to do this. So I went and I applied anyway. But I feel like we don't just need to educate our young people in video games, we need to educate the teachers, the parents, and the people who are ultimately helping their children make these decisions. Um, there'll be a lot of parents that think, video games? That's, that, that doesn't sound like a, a good use of your time. Um, and I think it was, um, I was talking to Susanna about this earlier, like, um, it's because games in general aren't represented as a medium that you, that's important. Um, I think it was yesterday the program for Scottish government was released. And um, I was reading through it and it was saying, um, and support for creative industries is really important. And I was like, yes, finally. I kept reading and it said film and television and stopped and that was it. And it was like, we have such a huge mm. games community in Scotland that I was really disappointed that needed to be addressed. And if that's not shown in, in wider areas, we'll never, we'll never be taken seriously. So to tackle that, we need programs in place such as STEM ambassadors and video games ambassadors. So what I do is I go into schools and I, or I go to um, summer events, that's quite a lot of what I've been doing recently, and go into workshops for children to understand what career, interdisciplinary careers are really, and focusing on video games and the different areas of video games because um, a lot of people I found a lot of parents especially find, think that a career in video games or a career in the games industry is a career playing video games. And that's not the case. There are definitely, there's the gaming industry, there's eSports, um, but that's not the case for making games. You, you don't even need to be good at playing games to make games. I'm terrible at them. Um, <laughs> but, so if we educate the parents knowing that there's all these areas like um, programming for maths and science and art and a lot of people can make big careers on, on art and design and writing and there's also areas even that are overlooked like PR and, and QA and HR in the games industry which I think that all these options 
just aren't described to people. Um, obviously, as a programmer, I specifically come in and I talk about programming careers, but I also talk about video games careers in general. Um, and I think it's starting to actually see a difference. It's definitely making a difference in the sense that um, the people I see come into the workshops leave excited and engaged. Um, the last problem with this is a lot of the people, a lot of these workshops and career seminars are usually with children who are 14 to 16, choosing their hires. That's too late. It's far too late. People have made up their minds, really. Like, they might not know what they want to do, but they know that there are certain areas. Whereas if you reach kids when they are 10 to 12, they're starting to pick their, um, what are they called now? They're not intermediate uh, uh, exams. When they're choosing these, that's far more useful. I mean, I didn't take computing um, as one of my uh, standard grades, but I had to crash hire it so that I could get into university. Um, but yes, that's where the STEM ambassadors come in to try and bridge that gap. I think what you mentioned there was quite interesting. So I was recently on holiday, and what I found was we were, um, we took our kids to this play area called Kidsania, and this was in Dubai. And I thought it would just be like a soft play center like you have over here, but interestingly what it is, it's like a micro version of the real world for kids to interact with. So they get to see real careers um, and experience those and work in those to get an idea of what it's like. Um, so they had different um, careers represented there. So you could become, you could be a dentist, you could be a firefighter, you could work in construction, um, and quite a few others. No, video games were not represented, um, but they also had like you know the um, the food and beverages industry as well. So I, mean, I thought it was a fascinating concept. So the idea, you you go in, you go to the bank, and you're given a certain amount of money. And then you have to work various jobs, learn about them to earn more money that you can then spend in this city mm -hmm. and you know on, on the fun things. Um, but what I sort of found extremely interesting as I walked past these different zones were that in the construction zone, it was all girls in there building, working away, and um, no boys in sight. Um, even though they had a sign that said, caution, men at work. Um, <laughs> then when you go to the manufacturing zone, it was 95% girls in there again, no boys to be seen. And so, and age-wise as well, I think it was, they were as young as sort of six, seven, all the way up to 15, 16. And to me, what's fascinating is this whole thing that you were saying about educating people. So the kids are clearly interested, these girls are interested in these different industries. Um, and they spend quite a considerable time playing there. And yet somehow there's a disconnect between the interest that they're showing and then the careers that they're actually pursuing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who's absent out of them. Maybe it's the parents thinking that, you know, it's not a worthwhile area to pursue. Um, but I just found that really, really fascinating to observe and to see. And I was just thinking, is there any way that you can sort of tap into that and get them to push forward mm -hmm. and pursue those as viable career paths. Um, I think what I'm going to do is ask one last question and I'm going to direct that towards Suzanne and then I'll just open the floor for some questions from the audience. So I guess my question for you is based on your sort of experience and having done consultancy for such a long time, what do you think are the biggest hurdles to get sort of women into games and um, how do you over Come that yeah. very quickly. <laughs> it's a good question. So I'm delighted we've got as many women as we do in the audience today. Um, I will tell you how I got into games first, um, and because I, I think it's relevant to this discussion. And I'm a big nerd. I like to read, and I like to see speakers. And I'm really interested. I was fascinated and hugely inspired by the work of Jane McGonigal, who wrote a, uh, did a game called Super Better. And what was so interesting to me was that. At the time I heard her speak, it was probably one of the first times I'd ever heard anybody talk about a game where there was not shooting, there was not, you know, stereotypes of people. It was all about getting healthier quicker. And, and, and I just thought the book was so much about what we could achieve <laughs> for social change if we got people thinking through. And, and the book, Reality is Broken, is that we actually need to create the world more like games and, and give people this sense of an action that they can take that will affect the rest of, rest of us. And I was hugely inspired by that. Um, so I think that the kind of, the insight that I have around it is the same that got me into this 20 years ago. So my PhD looked at the experiences of women and ethnic minorities in engineering. And one of the best ways that engineering has tried to embrace a wider range of people is talk about the social impact 
that your company and that the work you're doing on it has on the world and that is actually one of the best ways that they have been able to attract more women to the industry. Now everybody, men and women, want to make a social impact but this seems particularly important in the recruiting and the way they get girls earlier on interested in these, in these fields. Um, so I think f really talk about social impact and anybody who doesn't think that games have a huge social impact needs to really think about how much they reflect the world that we live in um, and, and they're created by humans, right? So some people say games are fantasy, but actually let's look at the way we personify people in these games. It's not my fantasy to be a damsel in distress or to be a, you know, a sex fixin. I, I wanna have a multiplicity of roles open to me. Um, and that's why we need them in that area. So I think looking at social impact is really important. I think the second thing is in the debate around um, the space for all types of people, we need to have a much more hospitable environment. So I'm not gonna get into Gamergate huge, but I, I think what's interesting is that there is, when anybody talks about the types of roles that people who are not, um, that people when they question uh, the stereotypes in a lot of games, they're hit with huge trolling and vitriol. But Mark Lees, you know, was talking about this two weeks ago and the way that actually we have to, um, you know, look at the link between people who are putting out that hate into the world against the people who are questioning, you know, there's a, a, really, a really symbiotic relationship between that and what we're seeing in the world politics, where there's a silent minority of people who feel that they've been left behind and are really challenging that. And I think that we need to think through that and create better environments for people to have these more open discussions um, so that, you know, a wider range of people can thrive. Uh, thanks. So Suzanne, I'm, I'm getting uh, signals there from Mel to say wrap it up. Are we, do we have time for questions? One question. Okay, uh, so I'm going to open the floor up for the person who puts up their hand the quickest uh, who has a question for any one of the panelists. Yes. So I'll just repeat the question in case you haven't heard it at the back. The question was, um, how supportive have your employers been when you've tried to do things to do that deal with outreach and advocacy? I will make this short because I cannot talk about my employer at all. I will leave that. So that answers my question from, uh, what about yourself? Um, I was very surprised because um, when I did Rainbow Jam last year, like I raised money for prizes and stuff like that and my employer just immediately said yes, here's a, here's a pot of money to kind of go do that. Um, so I think that was quite, uh, quite, quite nice. Um, but I, d I do have like kind of anecdotal stuff from friends and at various different companies where they can't really do stuff like this, even just like general little panel things they can't really do, or they can't associate themselves with their company at all. Um, so it's quite interesting. I think it very much depends on the company and their culture and their kind of management structure. Um, but from a personal experience, I've, I've never really had any issue. And Suzanne, you run your own company, so? Yeah, I run my own company, so, and <laughs> if you want to work with us, you kind of got to get this. Um, so, I wouldn't say that's been an, an issue. I think I, what I've been heartened uh, by is the number of people, even in major corporates, who when they see our games are like, we've never seen anything like this before. And they like the, the, the narrative aspect of what we do. Um, so they've been encouraging that way. But I would also say, even when we're looking at money, we've had grants from you know Scottish government because, again, they say, we've never seen anything like this. And we like that you're at the forefront of trying to make games that have a social impact and make people think about the, their hiring practices and how they you know, work in the workplace. So, so that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to call it a wrap there. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.